Hey, good morning. I am, well, maybe it's not morning where you are, but I am coming to you from my beautiful gear library here in the Pacific Northwest where it's extremely rainy. And I woke up this morning and this story popped into my mind. And those of you who know me know that, or have been following this blog, know that I love stories. And this was, I guess it's not so much a story, but it's a memory. And I don't know if I've shared my story and how I ended up living in the Pacific Northwest. But if you can sort of bear with me here, I'll explain it. So I, when I was 11 years old, I decided that I wanted to become a park ranger. And I started volunteering with the National Park Service. I volunteered at a little park in Pennsylvania called Hopewell Furnace National Historic Site. It's a beautiful little park. I did living history. I dressed in 1830s clothes. Yes, wearing a bonnet. And I just loved it. It was, those were like the best summers of my childhood. And I, uh, so I, I wanted to be a park ranger then, went through college, or applied to get into college. I went to this uh, very small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania called Franklin and Marshall College. And when I got to college, every single person was pre-med, right? So you get to college and you think, oh shoot, if I'm not pre-med, I'm doing something wrong. So I became pre-med in college, which was great because it kept me out of trouble because I was more worried about passing my organic chemistry test or physics. And I ended up getting a job working in a trauma unit, which I loved. Um, but as I sort of near graduation, I wasn't quite ready to take my MCATs yet. I, after working in the hospital, I also was having a hard time seeing myself being in a hospital all the time. I'm a very outdoorsy person and that concept I was struggling with a little bit. So I decided to take a year off to work and prep for my MCATs. So I was in the process of that. I actually took a class uh, to, to help me study for my MCATs. I was going to take them and I was out at the National Park volunteering and I was really struggling with this whole career thing because I think when you have, especially pre-med, when you've told everybody, I'm gonna be a doctor, you just feel like you're letting people down if you don't go through with that, right? Because everybody's so proud of you that you're gonna be a doctor. And so there was a lot of shame, I think, on my part in even questioning that that's what I wanted to do, right? Because I had this amazing education. Why wouldn't I be pre-med? Uh, why wouldn't I want to go to medical school? Isn't that what everybody wants to go to school and have $400,000 in debt? I mean, that sounds great to me. So I was talking with the superintendent of the National Park and he said, well, what do you love to do? And I said, well, I love to volunteer here. I'd like to do that full time. <laughs> and it was sort of tongue in cheek, but he looked at me and said, well, why don't you become a park ranger? He said that we're hiring law enforcement rangers and you could go to a police academy and become a park ranger. And it was like a lightning bolt just came out of the sky and hit me. And it was sort of like, what the heck? Like that's what you knew you wanted to do that all along. And I remember I called my dad on the way home and my dad spent his entire career working for the federal government. And I said, hey, I'm going to go to an academy and I'm gonna become a park ranger. And so I applied for some police academies that specifically certify you to become a park ranger. And the one that I found was in Mount Vernon, Washington. And being from the East Coast, the only Washington, you have to remember when you're on the East Coast, the only Washington that exists is Washington, D.C. And so I saw Mount Vernon, Washington, and I thought, oh, Mount Vernon near Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah, I'll be so close to home. Wrong. I was not close to home. I had applied to one in Washington State, unbeknownst to me. And I remember I kept trying to get a hold of the guy who ran the academy and I'd call him at 4 p.m. And like, why the heck is this guy never answer his freaking phone? Oh wait, probably because he's home at dinner because there's a three hour time difference, you doofus. So once I figured it out, I sort of was taken aback a little bit, like, oh crap, I just applied to an academy in Washington State. And then secondly, I thought, wow, that would be really cool. I've never been to Washington State. so. 
I decided to move to Washington temporarily just for the academy. My plan was to come back to Pennsylvania to become a park ranger. I moved to Washington, completely fell in love with it here, fell in love with the mountains, fell in love with everything, and decided, nope, this has to be permanent. So I went back home, and I had a month back at home before I ended up coming back out to Washington for my first job out here with the Park Service. And right before I left, my mom threw me this little going away party, which was attended by her friends <laughs> and one of her friends we were all standing around the island in my parents kitchen and one of her friends remarked to me she said oh it's just Anastasia and another one of her adventures and oh, that just stuck with me and it's still stuck with me because I sort of I think about that now and of course, it's, I've been out here for 15 years and built my entire life and my career out here. And I just remember thinking, like, how dare you say that? This is not just me and another one of my adventures. This is me doing what I want to do and listening to my heart and my dreams. And how dare you try to tell me that that's not the right thing to do and I remember at the time thinking I'm gonna prove her wrong and I really didn't care about her in particular it was just sort of that idea that that following my dream was silly or childish or foolish or something along those lines and it got me thinking this morning, for whatever reason, when I woke up, that memory popped into my head. And I thought, gosh, how many people are out there that get an idea of something they want to do? And that voice, whether it's a literal voice, like in my case, or a figurative voice, how many people hear that and listen to it? And maybe there are situations where we should listen to the voice because maybe some things that we want to do are ridiculous. And I think that that voice in some way is meant to protect us. Um, I think it's probably our subconscious saying, oh, this could not work or you could be taking a risk. Be careful. Don't you just want to stay at home and lead this extremely predictable, boring life? Doesn't that sound nice? <laughs> and I, I think so from that perspective, I understand it because I think our brain naturally wants to protect us. Why wouldn't it? It doesn't want stress. It doesn't want us to be in a situation where we're worried about things. So staying put, staying uh, with what's familiar, those are things that our brain is going to encourage us to do. Those are things that other people are going to encourage us to do because when they see somebody who's out there living exactly what they want to do, it makes them uncomfortable. Maybe because they didn't do it or maybe because they're almost like sympathetically uh, afraid for you, right? They almost are projecting that stress of, oh my gosh, she does not know what she is getting into, uh, that sort of thing onto you. And I think in some places it's reasonable. For instance, if I decided that I was going to go just do something really stupid or potentially harmful to myself, I would want that voice to kick in and say, hey, maybe this isn't a great idea, come on. But when we're talking about listening to your dreams, as long as they're valid and reasonable dreams and, and there's something that in there that just deeply resonates with who you are as a person, why wouldn't you explore that or at least investigate the possibility of it? And I think that this fear is what's holding us back so much. And I think that recognizing that that voice is there is a huge part of this. So I, for instance, I have this happen all the time to me, even now. I am an idea person and I get so creative and I come up with all these ideas and I'll get so excited about them. And then 10 minutes later, I can feel the self-doubt start to creep in. Like, no, you probably shouldn't do that. Or no, that's not gonna work out. You should just stick with what you're doing. Or no, and, and, I, and, and you can actually feel, physically feel 
that excitement that you had start to go down as you start to talk yourself out of something. And I cannot even count how many things I've talked myself out of. And I think recognizing, I think the fact that I had that literal voice speak to me has helped me along the way to recognize those times when I've been doing it to myself. Not always, and I still do it, but I think just stopping and, and recognizing it and saying, hey, wait a second, that's my mind taking over. That, that's, not, that's not what I want. That's my brain getting in there and telling me, hey, don't do something because it could cause you some stress. This might be more difficult than what you're doing right now. Or this might cause a little bit of discomfort. Don't do it. But the flip side of that is look at the reward that you get from doing something challenging. I think about climbing a mountain because, of course, that's my favorite metaphor in history. Look at climbing a mountain. If you stopped, or I mean, I look at the people who stop at camp. Oh, I can't do it. They've talked themselves out of it before they've even gotten started. And I think of all the times when I didn't do that, when I got out of the sleeping bag, when it was bitterly cold out and it was the last thing I wanted to do, but I still got out of that stupid sleeping bag and I climbed the mountain and I got to stand on the top and feel what that feels like to be on top of a mountain with nowhere else to go up anymore and you're just looking around at all of those peaks and everything I mean, it's just the most beautiful thing you could ever imagine. I'm like, you know, if I hadn't gotten out of that sleeping bag in the first place, none of this would have ever happened. Climbing the mountain is easy compared to getting out of the sleeping bag. And I think so many of us in, in life, we're just stuck in that sleeping bag. Like, oh, it's warm and cozy and comfortable in here and I don't want to get out because it's cold. Yeah, but guess what? Nothing good happens in the sleeping bag other than you just lay there and rot in the sleeping bag. You don't get to see the views. You don't get to climb. You don't get in better shape. You don't get to experience things. You just lay in the sleeping bag. Who cares? You can lay in the sleeping bag at home if you want to. <laughs> so, I, I, gosh, I'm clearly so passionate about this. And I... I just needed to get this out. But I think when you have those moments in your life where you find yourself holding yourself back, I want you to just visually imagine yourself getting out of the sleeping bag, close your eyes and say, am I, am I trying to hide in this warm cocoon because it's safe and comfortable and because I don't want to get out where it's cold, but where something remarkable might happen? Am I missing out on this chance for something truly amazing in my life? And really, you deserve that. I'm sorry, you do. All of us have it in us. And it's just a matter of who is ready to take off the sleeping bag and get cold and go out into that bitter night air and feel that blast on their face of cold air and breathe it in their lungs and just let themselves come to life. And that's what I'm excited about, <laughs> obviously. So I don't know. This is the sort of thing that pops in my head at 8 a.m. and then I put on a hat and record it. So I hope it sparked something in somebody out there and my job will have been done. So have an awesome day.